everyone. How's everyone doing today? Okay, a little, little bit half-hearted, I'll say, but it's that time of year, isn't it? Everything kind of is changing, cold is in the air. Um, cold is inside us, and uh, yeah, so, uh, so my voice goes in the middle, that'll be why. Um, I, I wasn't sure whether to share this this morning at all, and so I've kind of, um, I, but I'm, I'm going to, it's not quite in my notes, but um, I'm going to share. Just to, so, so we've been praying for something as, as a family for quite a long time, and we've been, we've been going through, there's, there's some challenges that we've been facing as a family, been really hard, and there are moments where... I don't know if you ever find this where you feel like you can't, you just can't do it on your own. You just, you're finding it really, really difficult. And, and that's why I love being part of a family, part of a community, because other people have been able to pray for us when we feel like we haven't been able to pray those prayers ourselves. And so um, a couple of weeks ago, something dramatically, miraculously changed for us in our family. And, 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 and <laughs> It's incredible when you, when you kind of think, I haven't got, I, I can't do this in my own strength anymore. And in fact, that's probably the first realization we need to come to. There's a lot that we can't do in our own strength. But we do have a God who is present to us in our times of trouble. A God who we can look to when we feel like we can't pray those prayers anymore. And the beautiful thing about his church is that we get to be in this together. And we get to look out for one another and we get to lift one another up. And so we've had an incredible breakthrough. And, and, and I, just, I just sense for our, for our church family that there are, there are people here who have been praying for things for years and years and years. And you haven't seen that breakthrough. And I'm not going to stand here and say that everything is going to change. Because honestly, it's made life more complicated. It's made life a lot more complicated, the breakthrough that we've experienced. But God is present in those moments. And I believe that he is able to bring breakthrough where we don't feel like he can bring breakthrough. Because he is the God who is able. He is the God of the miraculous. He's the God of the impossible. And so I just really want to take this moment just in our service. If, you, if there is something that you've been praying for, for maybe it's weeks, maybe it's months, years, and you're just like, Lord, I really need to see a breakthrough in this, in, in this area. I would love to pray for you in this moment. And, and I'm just going to pray and then we'll, we'll, we'll carry on. So, Lord, we, we thank you that you are the God of the impossible. And God, I want to give you thanks and praise for the change that we've seen in our, in our family over these last couple of weeks. And, and Lord, I, ha- I have faith now. Sometimes I don't have faith. I don't have a lot. But you say that faith as small as a mustard seed can move a mountain. And so I pray, Lord, for the those of us that are hanging on to a dream, who are praying prayers that they feel are never going to get answered. Lord, I pray for a significant change in our situations. Lord, we put our trust and our hope and our faith in you. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, so over these last few weeks, we've been thinking about leadership. Um, and so I, I, lo- I love the idea that every single one of us has an opportunity to influence others. And, and I think Andy said the other week that even the most introverted of us will likely influence over 10,000 people in our lifetime. That's quite remarkable, isn't it? All we need to be is to be one step ahead of someone else. And I believe that our world desperately needs people like you and I to step up as healthy leaders in the workplace, um, as school governors, um, as leaders of parent-teacher associations, creating safe spaces for our children. In the church, we need more leaders who will create welcoming environments for people to come into, for people to lead small groups, creating spaces where we can help one another grow as disciples. And so today we're wrapping up our series on leadership as we think about leading through serving, as we look at 1 Timothy chapter 5. So I'm going to pray for us, and then if you want to turn in your Bibles, that would be amazing. The words will come up behind us. But Lord, as we open up scripture today, 
Would you open our ears to hear your words to us? Help us to hear your voice today, Jesus. Amen. So we're going to read through uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5. This is Paul in his inimitable style, going straight for it. Um, So I'm just giving you a bit of a warning. So uh, here we go. Do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he were your father. Treat younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters with absolute purity. Give proper recognition to those widows who are really in need. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, they should learn first of all to put their religion into practice by caring for their own family, and so repaying their parents and grandparents, for this is pleasing to God. The widow who is really in need and left all alone alone, puts her hope in God and continues night and day to pray and to ask God for help. But the widow who lives for pleasure is dead even while she lives. Give the people these instructions too, so that no one may be open to blame. If anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for his immediate family, he is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. No widow may be put on the list of widows unless she is over 60, has been faithful to her husband, and is well known for her good deeds, such as bringing up children, showing hospitality, washing the feet of the saints, helping those in trouble, and devoting herself to all kinds of good deeds. As for younger widows, do not put them on such a list. For when their sensual desires overcome their dedication to Christ, they want to marry. Thus, they bring judgment on themselves because they have broken their first pledge. Don't worry, we'll talk about this in a minute. Besides, they get into the habit of being idle and going about from house to house. And not only do they become idlers, but also gossips and busybodies saying things they ought not to. So I counsel younger widows to marry, to have children, to manage their homes, and to give the enemy no opportunity for slander. Some have, in fact, already turned away to follow Satan. If any woman who is a believer has widows in her family, she should help them and not let the church be burdened with them, so that the church can help those widows who are really in need. The elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, especially whose work is preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, do not muzzle the ox while it is treading out the grain, and the worker deserves his wages. Do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless it is brought by two or three witnesses. Those who sin are to be rebuked publicly so that the others may take warning. I charge you in the sight of God and Christ Jesus and the elect angels to keep these instructions without partiality and to do nothing out of favoritism. Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands and do not share in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. Stop drinking only water and use a little wine because of your stomach and your frequent illnesses. The sins of some men are obvious, reaching the place of judgment ahead of them. The sins of others trail behind them. In the same way, good deeds are obvious, and even those that are not cannot be hidden. Wow. Sadly, I don't have all day to kind of unpack everything here. Um, But I do just want to make reference to the context into which Paul is talking to you, because I think this is really important. I think it helps us to understand um, what Paul is getting at here, because there's some strong words to wi- certain widows. Um, there, there, there's a lot in here. So, so there was, um, the, what, what happened was the early church had become really well known for looking out for the poor and the needy in their community, right? So they were really good at doing that. And, and there was this Roman emperor at the time, a guy called Julian, the apostle, state and he, he he there's a great quote from me he, he basically says he complains about the impious galileans who support not only their poor but ours as well you see the early church had become really well known for doing good things and the church in ephesus was no different it, and, and we think about the context of the society there. It's a really patriarchal society where women needed the support of a man. To, um, to they, they didn't work and so in that society, and so it means they needed a man there to provide and to bring in money and food and all those kind of things. 
So what happened was alongside a bunch of really needy widows, people who really needed the help of the church, there were also a bunch of people who really didn't need that help. And yet they took advantage of the kindness of the church family. And I believe this is the context into which Paul is speaking into, providing guidance to Timothy and the church leadership on how to deal with these issues really well. And so I hope that gives us some understanding of the context in which it's being spoken into. And so this passage is part of Paul's letter to Timothy and the whole church in, in Ephesus. He's writing the church but to the church, but if you're here and you don't yet know Jesus, I just want to say, I hope what I share is really helpful and you are so, so welcome. Um, but we're going to specifically talk about leading and serving, and I'd love to just kind of share a few thoughts on that. So the world will often say to us that those two words do not go very well together. Serving, leading. You know, we, when we, the, the world will often say that we don't have to serve when we lead. We can give up doing menial tasks and allow others to serve us. Yet someone famously once said, if serving is below you, leadership is beyond you. And I love what the educator, author, and civil rights lawyer, Dr. Artika Tyner says. She says, serve others. The heart of a leader is manifested through service to others. The heart of a leader is manifested through service to others. So those two quotes that I've just shared bring about a very different perspective on leadership. So if leading is serving, is about serving others. How can we lead others well? Well, I believe the first thing we need to do is to look to Jesus. And that might seem obvious, but it, you know, Paul writes towards this as well. But it's just 2,000 years ago, the Jewish people, if you can think, a few years before the early church, well, bef- um, before Jesus had arrived, they were waiting for a Messiah to come and to save them. And they expected a triumphant king. You know, They had the Romans ruling there, and they wanted some kind of king who would overthrow the rule of the Romans. What they got was a baby born into a manger. A man who grew up to say, blessed are the peacemakers, and who ended up giving his life as a sacrifice for us all. And there are many examples of Jesus being a servant leader that we read in the Gospels. And perhaps, probably my favorite and a really beautiful example of this is where Jesus washes the feet of his disciples. And you may remember that story, and Paul refers to the washing of feet in verse 10. And and recorded in John 13, Jesus and and his disciples had had walked to to this venue, maybe the upper room, and, and it would have been the norm because they had dusty feet for a servant to come and get a basin out and start washing their feet. But nobody steps up. Until that is Jesus ties a towel around his waist. He gets a basin of water and starts to wash each of his disciples' feet. And then as he dries their feet with the towel, he he tells the disciples that they should also wash each other's feet. Jesus here takes on the role of a servant as the most extraordinary demonstration to his followers. He takes this little moment, and I love how you see him doing this through the Gospels, to teach his disciples something. And here he's teaching them that leadership is actually all about serving others. That to lead well, we must take on the attitude of a servant, leading others with humility, And then we see in Matthew 20, 28, that Jesus said he did not come to serve, rather to serve others and to give his life as a ransom to many. And Paul, who wrote this letter, he, in another of his letters, when he's encouraging the church in Philippi, he encourages them to have an attitude as that of Christ Jesus himself. So what we do when we serve others is we actually bring Jesus to others. We bring some of his light, some of his healing into the brokenness of our world. Take a Sunday morning. Say you walk in here for the first time. The first person you see is one of our amazing car park team. Big smile on their face, welcoming them in. Maybe someone who's never been inside a church before. 
Maybe for those of us that, you know, we come, I need caffeine this morning. You go in your head for, for coffee. Maybe you're a tired and broken parent and someone pours you a cup of coffee. That's a beautiful thing. It's amazing when we get to serve others by listening to their story or by going out of our way to be kind to someone of a different ethnic background. These are just some of the ways that we get to show and demonstrate the love of Jesus as we serve others, as we release his healing into the world around us. Serving isn't just about bringing healing to other people. The reality is we actually often bring healing to ourselves as we serve others. Because when we serve others, we lay down our egos. We lay down our own sense of entitlement. And I love how John Mark Comer, the author and pastor, he puts it like this. He says, when we serve in the name of Jesus, the lines blur between servant and served giver and recipient. Both give and both receive. Dignity is restored in one, freedom in the other. Isn't that a beautiful picture? As we serve others, we are leading them to Jesus. As we receive freedom, we release dignity to the other. And as we treat people with dignity, and this is the second thing I want to share this morning, is we treat others as family. And we see it throughout this passage, don't we? Taking care of the old and the young in verses one and two. Treating younger men like brothers, treating younger women as sisters with absolute purity in verse two. Taking care of the needy in verses three and four. Looking after our extended family in verses seven to eight. Taking care of leaders in 17 to 18. And then Paul even advocates a little bit of self-care for Timothy in verse 23, encouraging the use of a little wine. Now, we need to take that how we need to take it. For some of us, that's helpful. Others of us, that's really not helpful. So I want to let you work that out, whether that's a good thing for you or not. Um, Have a chat with me afterwards if you need to. Um, But when we show kindness towards those who are struggling... When we treat another person with respect and love, dignity, fairness, we express some of the servant heart of Jesus. And yet, I don't know if you noticed this, but if we look out in the world around us, isn't the world so obsessed by individualism? You do you, I'll do me. Take what you can, take what you need, what you want from the world. Now, if we're honest, if we're really honest with ourselves, I think that most of us, at least to some degree, live with that same intrinsic belief that our needs are greater than our, our neighbours. And, I'll, and I'll, I'll demonstrate a couple of examples of this, and you might think, that's not me, that's not me. Perhaps you kind of think, hey, I'm, I'm in a bigger rush than, so, than you, so I'm just going to push my car out a little bit further ahead of yours at the junction because I need to get there quicker than you do. Thus saying, we're more important. And this might be a little bit controversial, but, oh, man, I can't get out to small group tonight. I can't get out to that prayer meeting because I've had a busy day. Um, And when we do that, we forget that we are not there just to get something out of it. We actually have something to bring ourselves. We're there to bless and encourage others. We have a role to play. Or perhaps this other one, if you, you kind of, you're just about to leave the house and you suddenly look out of the window and you notice that your neighbor has also left the house at the same time as you. And so I haven't got time to talk to my neighbor today. I just need my own space. And so you delay it just a minute or so, just so you don't have to encounter your neighbor on the driveway. Does, has anyone experienced anything like that? I see a few smiles around the room, so I'm not the only one. You know, we intrinsically believe that our needs are sometimes greater than others. But the truth is, friends, that we need one another to follow Jesus well. Even the most introverted of us are created to be with others. And this is John Mark Homer again. He says, the radical individualism of Western culture is not only a mental health crisis and growing social catastrophe. 
It's a death blow to any kind of serious formation in Christ-like love because it's in relationships that we are formed and forged. There's a lot in there, isn't there? But the way that society is going, it's messing with our mental health, It's a growing social catastrophe. But even more than that, for us, for those of us that follow Jesus, it's actually ripping apart our own own formation, our own spiritual formation. We are meant to be formed in Christ-like love, and we only do that properly within community. We only do that with the input of others. As we bless others, they bless us, and we bless one another and serve one another. So if we're doing life in Jesus without community, we are not doing it right. If we're not willing to give up one evening a week to pray or join a small group, we're saying, I can do fine on my own, thanks. Plus, I don't really have much to offer anyway, do I? If we're not stepping up to lead, perhaps, because we're too busy, we've missed the point or we've prioritized the wrong things, Life has got too comfortable for many of us. We are designed to live in community. We're made to serve one another. We need one another to grow as disciples. I once heard this said, we generally sin alone, but we heal together. I'm going to repeat that because I think it's pretty powerful. We generally sin alone, but we heal together. We need others to help us heal. Or as the Alcoholics Anonymous say, they say, I get drunk, we stay sober. We need one another to do well in life. We desperately need each other. I love how the early church followed the lead of Jesus. They shared everything that they had. They gave generously to those in need. They took care of widows. In other words, they treated one another as family. So as Christians, we love God first. And second, we love one another. And we love others well by serving one another well. But where do we begin? Where do we start with that? And, And I believe it's really simple. We begin by serving where we are. So many of us will often throw obstacles in the way. It's like, oh, this isn't really my thing. You know, I can, I'm built for bigger things than uh, ushering someone into the car park or, you know, or making a cup of tea for somebody at work. I'm too busy. Maybe my English is not good enough. I can't do that because my English is not good enough. And there are always people better than me. If I'd have followed along that line, I wouldn't be standing here today because there are always people better than us, okay? The problem with most people is that those reasons center around what I can't do, around my preferences. Yet godly leadership is not about my strengths, praise God. It's about how God uses us even, or should I say, especially in our weakness, My own leadership journey is really just one of saying yes to the opportunities in front of me. At Riverside, the first team I served on was the books and media desk. Does anyone, I mean, there's probably a few people around remember that. I mean, when I was around, it was like, at least there were CDs. We kind of graduated from the cassette tape, but um, there were CDs. There was a little disc when you could stick headphones on and listen to them, to to the music there. Um, Was it my thing? I mean... No, not really, but it was the op- I was asked to do that, and I did, and then I led that team. Um, I eventually got involved in things like youth work and, and small groups. Kathy and I have led a number of different small groups over the years and, and multiplied some of those groups as well. You know, really, like leadership starts by serving where we are today. That's it. And so one thing we often say at Riverside is that we never graduate from doing the jobs that no one else wants to do. You see, serving can often be seen as the place where you start out, but that isn't how it's like in the kingdom of Jesus. In my early days working, you know, a nine-to-five office job, 
I was on the lowest rung, and so there was an expectation that I would be the one to make everyone a coffee in the morning or in the afternoon, or whenever I need a drink, that was my job, or I would take my lunch break, but only when it suited other people. And maybe in a church, there's an expectation that there are things that a pastor or leader shouldn't do. So I'll be honest with you, there are times when I might pick up some chairs, or I might, you know, go and clean up some kind of mess in another room in the building. Um, And, you know, there are times when maybe I shouldn't do that, but there are times when actually I really should be doing that. You know, that is part of serving, that's part of leading. And so we often say, we never graduate from cleaning the toilets or from emptying the bins. I can, you know, doing some of that yesterday. You know, it's just like that's, that's part of the life of a leader. That's part of how we serve one another well. And so in the church, we lead by doing the job sometimes that nobody else wants to do. And one more thing before we take some time to pray. I just want to say leadership is task over title. And we see this in verse 22. What I mean is that we must be willing to serve, even if we aren't given the title of leadership. Now, if you notice this, but the world craves titles. The world craves power. But Jesus looks at our hearts. Do you remember the story of Samuel anointing David in the Old Testament? Samuel was so like, looking at all David's brothers thinking, oh, they're strong, they're handsome, they're like, this is the one, this is going to be the king. And, and God's like, no, 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 not him, not him, not him. And they get down to the lowest brother, you know, the one who's out in the fields tending the sheep, and God says, that's the one. I look at the heart. You're looking at the flesh, basically. And, but then David doesn't take on that role of leadership for many years. I think it's about 30 years until he becomes king. And so, you know, he might have been doing those things. He might have been serving in many ways and acting more like a king than the real king. But he didn't have that role initially. And so Paul says in verse 22, he says, Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands. In other words, don't release leadership before people are ready. Don't give people titles before they've demonstrated their own character. And and part of my role in, in the church is to release people to lead. But first and foremost, we look out for character. And that is demonstrated by looking for people who are willing to serve. And so for all of us, we show our character by serving whatever the task, whatever the situation. And one of the practical ways we demonstrate in this church is that we invite everyone to be a part of a team. Now, you might think, well, that's just to get jobs done and things like that. Honestly, the, the best thing I did in this church when I first joined was to join a team and to join a small group. And, and that may sound very, you might hear that all the time, but it's because I got to know other people. I got to have a circle of people around me who I knew and I got to know and, they, and, we, and I could become more of the person that God wanted me to be. But actually, we learn so much by doing that. But we also have a lot of fun as well. It's the best way to get to know others and to build relationship with one another. And the way that it works in our, in our church is that, is that three weeks out of four, other people serve us. And then one week a month, we get to serve others. That's, that's, pretty, that's a pretty good deal, right? And so we just want to invite you this morning, if you are not yet part of a team, to come and be a part of a team. And so we have some of these flyers out on the seats. It just says, join a Sunday team. And so if you're not, can you just wave those at me, just so I know, I'm pretty sure I've seen some around. Wonderful. So if you are not part of a team right now and you, and you would call Riverside Vineyard your home, I would love you to take a moment just to put your details on there and to tick one of the boxes on there. I'm going to talk very quickly about the teams and then there'll be an opportunity to hand those um, into the connect area at the end of the service as well. And so let, I just want to go through some of the teams. I've mentioned the car park team already. Now, I don't want to say that you know, there is a best team in the, you know, in, in, in the church line, but the, the car park, I mean, Alarine's not her head vehemently. You wouldn't think that she was part of a car park team, would you? But come rain, come shine, the team are out there, but they are the first people that often, you you get to be the first person that anybody sees when they walk into this church. And that's a wonderful thing. So all we're asking for is someone who can smile, who can say, come in. We're not asking for technical car parking ability. We're just looking for someone who can smile and welcome really, really well. 
I wonder if you also, maybe you're some, I think we've got some pictures just to show some, uh, some of these here. There you go. Maybe you're someone who, who just needs a bit of caffeine in the morning. Anyone need a bit of caffeine in the morning? Yeah, a few of us. Um, you are not alone. So c- come and join the refreshment team and get to bless others with caffeine in the morning. That's a beautiful thing. Or be the most popular person in the building and be the one that provides the donuts. Okay? You get to be that. Um, maybe you're someone, you know, just like maybe t- finances are a little bit tight. You're like, I really want to join the gym. I really want to join the gym, but I can't afford to do that. I've got a really good option for you. Come and join the venue team. You can lift some chairs around. You can come and be a part of that. You get to maybe move a few tables. It is a great bit of exercise once a month if you want to, you know, you can join more than that. But, you know, there's some great ways that we can serve others in really practical ways. Maybe you have kids in Young Vineyard or you're someone who just loves serving kids. We're looking for team to serve, especially in our additional needs team right now. And so, you know, there are so many kids struggling with additional needs and we'd love to really just just bless families. It is the most incredible thing when we get, for those that need that little bit of respite on a Sunday, to have a team that can look after them, that is a beautiful thing. And if you can come and help with that. Um, Kim, I don't want to embarrass you, but Kim, could you just wait? Because Kim's Kim's just over there. Go and chat to Kim if if that kind of speaks to you right now. And we're also looking for a team for our ones to threes as well. And so the sweetest age. They are very sweet at that age. And so, you know, they don't answer back at that age. So it's really good fun. You can come and be a part of that. Or most, well, maybe, maybe some of them. But, you know, you can come and be, a, there's some, definitely some shaking of heads there. But um, come and be a part of that as well. And we also need youth, um, particularly at 1115. We've got so many youth around at the moment, we need to multiply again. And so we'd love to be able to create more space for our youth as well. Um, if you're into tech, you know, sound, video, media, worship, musicians, we'd love some people that can, if you can play the drums, play a bit of bass, play some keyboard, something like that, we'd love you to come and, uh, come and be a part of that. And the final thing is, can you cook? So if you're someone that can cook, it's like, hey, I'd love to be able to cook for a few people. Um, come and, you know, write something on your card as well and just say, oh, I can cook. Um, isn't that a, a kid's TV show or something? I just... Just went back to some, something from about 10 years ago. Um, so um, why don't we, do, yeah, if you can just take a minute just to kind of fill that out where you are, you can take that to the connect area later. We also have a couple of people around. So Emilio is around if you want to chat about team. Emilio in, in the check shirt, we, we've, we're matching today. So uh, Emilio's got a better check shirt than I have. So go and chat to Emilio at the back there. And, um, and we'd love to help you find a team that works for you. So as I come into land, I, I just want to bring us back to the words that I shared earlier. Um, this, is, this is what John Mark Homer said. He said, when we serve in the name of Jesus, the lines blur between servant and served, giver and recipient. Both give and both receive. Dignity is restored in one, freedom in the other. Friends, we're in this together but we first need to look to Jesus. We need his presence. We need his power to change us. And so we just want to invite his presence to come in just a moment. I'm just going to share very quickly, just remind us of how we, we, we try and pray for one another at Riverside as well. And so we, there's a prayer model that we have that we found a helpful way um, just to pray more like Jesus did. And so we've simplified it down to a very simple three words, ask, pray, ask. Um, and now many of you will come into a different church setting from different places where you kind of like, inter- often we might intercede for a situation. And so when I, the church that I was growing up in, I was, if, I, if I was praying, I, I needed my eyes closed because if I didn't have my eyes closed, I was probably misbehaving. And so, you know, but we want to see what the Lord is doing. And so when we pray for one another, we want to have our eyes open to see what the Holy Spirit is doing in our lives as well. And so 
There's a big difference between intercession and ministry, the way we talk about it. So, you know, perhaps someone is facing a big pressured meeting at work tomorrow, or it's an interview or something like that. And actually, we want to we wanna minister to what they need in that moment. We can go away and intercede for that moment, just pray. Maybe it's 10 a.m. tomorrow. I'm going to pray at 10 a.m. tomorrow. But right now, I'm going to pray that you would receive the peace that you need to take you into that. And so we pray for peace to come. We pray with eyes open. We pray for peace to come. But we can intercede at any time, right? But when they're in front of us, we believe that the kingdom of God is near. The kingdom of God is present. And so we pray for the kingdom of God to meet the person in that moment. And we wait for that peace to come. And so we have this prayer model, which is ask, pray us. We ask the person what, what's going on in their lives. At the same time, what, what, what do you want Jesus to do for you? And we're saying to the Holy Spirit, what, what's going on here? Maybe there's some other thing that we want to um, we want to kind of speak to as well. And then we keep our eyes open and then we just pray. We pray simple prayers. I don't know if you've noticed this, but Jesus' prayers were a lot shorter than most of mine. Jesus was pretty direct in the way that he spoke to people. When we see healing, we speak, we command things to change because of the authority that we have. And then in general, we just want to make sure that generally guys are praying for guys, girls for girls, at least one person of the same gender. Just that I think that's a helpful, safe thing to do as well. And then we ask how it's going. Don't have to go on longer than than we need to. We might see something happening. We might decide we're going to pray some more and pray some more. Um, But we just want to keep, keep coming back. Ask, pray, ask. Okay? So that's a very quick summary of that. Why don't you stand with us, with me? I'm the only one standing. <laughs> There's no one here. What? So um, let's, let's pray. We just want to invite God's presence to come because we need his help. We, as I said before, we can't do this on our own, but first and foremost, we need his presence. So come, Holy Spirit.